twice long plays gave Miami leads. The first was a 76-yard touchdown pass to Jimmy Cephalo, launched by the youngest quarterback ever to start a Super Bowl. The second score came on a kickoff. Fulton Walker's 98-yard return was the first for a touchdown in Super Bowl history. In a game chock full of big plays, the best defense in the entire league produced quite a few of its own. It was a play the defense did not make that was crucial to this game. Both a certain touchdown and Miami's third world championship slipped away. With 10-10 left on the Rose Bowl clock, Miami clung to, but could not hold on to, their narrow lead. The Redskins deservedly were winners of Super Bowl 17. But the final score did not diminish the season-long accomplishments it took for the Dolphins to reach pro football's biggest game. The season opened in New York where Miami's offensive line shut down the feared sack exchange. Tackles John Giesler and Eric Loxo were awarded game balls for holding Mark Gastineau and teammates to zero sacks. Another prime element was the flawless faking of David Woodley, who suckered Klecko and company off their feet. The opener also showcased the versatility of the Dolphins' new shotgun formation. Don Schuler, an offensive aide called Tassif and John Sandusky, conceived a masterful game plan. But special teams also contributed to the 45-point onslaught. Figueroa back is a single safety. Dolphins should get pretty good field position. Figueroa moves upfield. Cuts to the right. Cuts it to the middle. He's at the 50. Up the far sideline. Breaks the tackle. 45, 40, 35 with the 30. Back to the middle. He's out of the 20. 15, 10, 5. Touchdown, Miami. In this initial game, a season-long trend emerged. A defense capable of not only creating turnovers, but taking them into the end zone. The Dolphin defense, soon to be nationally known as the Killer Bees, intercepted a pair of jet passes for touchdowns. Todd sprints back to his left. Good protection. He fires it. Going to be intercepted. And picking it off is Blackwood. He's out of the 20, the 15, out of the 10. Back to his left. He scores. Glenn Blackwood. Bo Camper threw the block on Chris Ward down by the goal line, and that's what got Blackwood into the end zone. Ending an eight-game jinx was a perfect way to start the 82 schedule. This was but the first of three critical wins over New York that would prove to be the key to the Dolphins' season.
The next week, with a player strike imminent, Miami barely squeezed by Baltimore in the Orange Bowl. Tommy Vigorito's clutch run was the last Dolphin touchdown in nine weeks. Eight were due to the strike. The ninth came because the team could manage only three field goals when the season resumed in Buffalo. But nine points was enough as Dolphin defenders picked off six passes. On a day for turnovers, the biggest was linebacker A.J. Dewey's theft of Joe Cribb's option pass in the end zone. It preserved a 9-7 victory and kept Miami's unbeaten record intact. With their offense sputtering, the streak could not last. On a Monday night in Tampa, it ended. Don Strzok relieved in the second half and nearly won the game on the strength of his accurate right arm. the Dolphins dropped their first game of the season 23 to 17 to their previously winless neighbors from upstate. The next Sunday, the team regrouped with a hard-hitting performance against the Vikings. Tommy Kramer was sacked five times and Minnesota was held to merely six yards in the second half. Miami's attack was back on track, and it kept Minnesota off balance all afternoon. Fullback Andra Franklin bulled his way to the best day of his two-year pro career as the Dolphins bounce back with an impressive victory over the Vikings. Seven days later, they traveled to New England, where snow and ice made the footing treacherous. With both teams slipping and sliding all day, Miami's best chance to score was thwarted by the frozen turf. Uwe von Schaumann's field goal try was low and blocked. With time running down in a scoreless tie, Patriots coach Ron Meyer did some sideline improvisation. What followed was one of the strangest events of the NFL season. In what is now known as the snowplow caper, New England's winning field goal attempt was made easier. The clean placement produced the only points of the game. Dolphins president Joe Robbie definitely was not pleased. It's the first time since I've been in professional football we've ever taken such serious exception to something which happened on the field. This defeat could cost us the home field advantage in the playoffs, in every game of the playoffs. And th that kind of thing should not occur as a result of somebody putting a snowplow run by a convict with a day off from prison uh, out onto the field to give special advantage to the home team. Under a powder blue sky, Shula's squad faced the Jets in a must-win situation. Jets show blitz. There's a the handoff. Franklin throw over the middle. 20, 15. Makes a top of the 10. Five. Touchdown. 68,000 fans witnessed one of the great games of the season on the emerald floor of the Orange Bowl. The lead seesawed between the sky-high Dolphins and the Jets, who since losing to Miami on opening day, were on a five-game tear. When New York went ahead 1917 in the fourth quarter, Shula turned to bullpen ace Don Strzok who went to work with 148 remaining. With clockwork precision, 
struck, hit six of seven passes, and drove his team 83 yards downfield. Now the unforgettable final seconds were left to Uwe von Schoen. Seven seconds on the board. Jets lead by two. Here it is. Sit down. Kick is up. He's got the distance on it. It is. Oh, von Schoen hits it. Von Schoen hits it with three seconds on the board. Von Schoen hammers one home from 47 yards. I've been broadcasting this team since the beginning, and I've never seen the entire bench run out on the field and swarm a player before the game was over, and that's what happened here. Home field advantage in the playoffs riding on every play, Miami would not be deterred. On Monday night, they beat Buffalo with an attack that produced 27 unanswered points. Shula's 200th regular season win wrapped up a playoff berth, but there was still one more hurdle ahead. Woodley back to throw. He has all day. He's firing deep to the corner. Shuffle a wide open touchdown. Brilliantly executed. In Baltimore, Woodley's three touchdown passes paced the third straight Dolphin victory and clinched the home field advantage. Now every tournament round would be played before friendly fans. Surely the most welcome development of the year was the dismantling of the two quarterback concept known as Woodstrock. For Don Strock firmly passed the baton to gifted young David Woodley. The chief strength of Miami's attack remained the men in the trenches. Their leader is Bob Kuchenberg, the epitome of the battle-tested warrior and one of the most popular players on the team. The Dolphins' other guard, all-pro Ed Newman, broke a leg late in the year, but the line never missed a beat because of fine blocking by number 60, Jeff Taves. There was also rising superstar center Dwight Stevenson, number 57, who drew raves all year. 1982 evoked memories of days gone by. A dominating line opening huge holes for a no-frills fullback in the Zonka tradition. In a world championship formula, the constant factor was a great defense known as... A killer B! Dolphins are number one! We got defense! Baumhauer, Betters, Bo Camper, Brzezinski, and two of the baddest brothers since the James boys, the Blackwoods. These were the killer bees. Along with Gordon, Roan, Small, and McNeil, they were a honeycomb of headers, swarming over opponents and yielding fewer yards and fewer touchdowns than any team in the league. In an era of high-flying attacks, this defense did something none other could. They consistently shut down the good passing team. Miami yielded only four touchdown passes over their last 10 games and led the league with 26 interceptions. Miami's killer B defense. In a word, they were unbelievable. With the playoffs approaching, Miami's home field advantage was of paramount importance. For amidst the bedlam of the Orange Bowl, visiting teams definitely did not feel welcome. 
Due to the intimidating din of doll fans, opposing players felt like they were facing a 12th man on the field. So amidst familiar surroundings, a relaxed David Woodley and friends took the field for the first round of the playoff tournament. But the carefree atmosphere was misleading. The Dolphins hadn't won a postseason game in nine years. Bob Kuchenberg was a survivor from that year, and he was determined to atone for the long laps. Against New England, the question was whether Woodley could withstand playoff pressure. The answer came when the offense rolled up 448 the yards. In the middle, he's firing deep. Rose, he's got it. Great catch. That ball was thrown a little bit high, but Joe left his feet and made a circus catch. Over the shoulder, right up the gut. Tight end, go deep. That's the name of that play. The young quarterback coolly hit 16 of 19 passes for 246 yards and two touchdowns to tight end Bruce Hardy. The team's 28 to 13 plowing of the Patriots repaid an IOU. And by advancing to the second round of the playoffs, the monkey was off Miami's back. In a game that was a rematch of last year's double overtime classic with the Chargers, the special team set the tone and opened the floodgates. Looks to his right, starts up the sidelines, into the middle, 10, 15, 20. Football! Dolphins have got the ball again, I believe. They've got it. Twice, Miami recovered fumble kickoffs and gave the gifts to an offense that cashed them in. For the third straight week, David Woodley was brilliant, passing for a near-perfect 17 of 22 aerial masterpiece. Woodley spread the wealth around, throwing to tight end Ron Lee and flanker Nat Moore. Woodley rolls to his right, wants to throw it. Moore! Touchdown! Woodley rolled to his right and drilled it. Miami opened a 24-0 lead that evoked elements of deja vu. And a young quarterback appeared about to fulfill his unlimited potential. But the big story was the defense. It shredded the Chargers' game plan and destroyed the NFL's most potent attack. Coriel was sacked five times, and Dan Fouts' nervous feet betrayed his frustration as he continually forced the football into heavy coverage. Miami racked up five interceptions, seven turnovers in all, in one of the great defensive postseason performances in NFL history. The Dolphins exited triumphant, and the Orange Bowl rattled and rocked with cheers. The 34 to 13 crushing of the Chargers settled an old debt with a rout. It was the revenge of the Killer Bees. Now with a deadly defense and a quarterback who had passed for over 80% in two playoff games, Miami would meet the Jets for the third time. But this one, would be for the championship of the AFC. For two rain-soaked quarters, the team slogged and slugged to a scoreless top. Finally, Woody Bennett ran for the game's first score. Another view reveals number 60 guard Jeff Taves paved the way for the only touchdown Miami would need. While the offense took a bow, a tip of the hat must go to Bill Arnsbach, Tom Keene, and Mo Scarry for implementing one of the great defensive game plans of all time. Todd
Todd was the target. The Jet quarterback suffered the stings and arrows of the killer bees. Three sacks, five interceptions, and a paltry 139 yards total offense. A title game record. On this muddy day, the ace in the Dolphins' defensive deck was A.J. Dewey. In his role as a rover, the fair-haired hero was a master of disguise. Both he and his teammates constantly shifted positions. Todd never knew where they would be, and number 77 had the game of a lifetime. Dewey's record-setting third pet was the game's biggest play. It's intercepted at the line of scrimmage. It's going to be run in for a touchdown by A.J. Dewey at the 10 to 5. He scores! Fittingly, the clinching score had come from a defense that permitted only three touchdowns in three playoff games. The result was an emotional victory that would take the team to Pasadena for Super Bowl 17. Miami's shutout of the Jets was the first in a championship game since the Dolphins themselves blanked Baltimore in 1971. Though they lost the Super Bowl that year, they rebounded to win the next two. It happened just 10 years ago. With the talent on this team, it could very well happen again. Tonight on Classic Sports Network, starting at 8, it's a full power hour of hard-hitting pro football action on NFL Films Theater. Then at 9, the L.A. Lakers and Philadelphia 76ers collide on the NBA on Classic Sports. Followed at 11 by Distant Replay featuring Will Chamberlain, only on Classic Sports Network. As the 1989 season dawned, the Dolphins were a team with as many questions as answers. As the 1989 season dawned, the Dolphins were a team with as many questions as answers. Critics dismissed Dolphins' hopes as just so much flag-waving and blue skies. But oh, what a difference a year makes. We'll see what we're made of. Marino drops the throw, straight back, he's going deep across the near side, it is caught for a touchdown! Great, great grab by Mark Duper. For the 89 Dolphins were made of something greater than the sum of their parts. Logan will grab it at the 4, straight out to the 5, 10 to 15 to the 20, 25 to the 30. Reach 1, he's in the open. Here is 50. He's at the 40, 35, 30, down to the 20, the 10, down to the 5, and a touchdown. But Logan really goes. I mean, he smokes it. Great grabs and dynamic dashes were de rigueur but only a subplot in the Dolphins' tale. The real story in South Florida is one of a team's coming of age with a bevy of bruising young defenders and hardcore hitters. Young players like Lewis Oliver. Pro Bowl tight end Farrell Edmonds. And rookie running back Sammy Smith. The 
89 Dolphins lacked neither courage nor pride, guts nor grace, as their season was nothing less than a prelude to glory. NFL Yearbook is brought to you by New York Life, the company you keep. Remember that one? He's a natural. Hey, Tommy, Joe. Hey, that one takes me back. <laughs> I love watching my highlights. Yeah, but what's funny is you're known as a hitter and player. What I remember is your pitching for Mr. Coffee. The best I've ever tasted. Nice. Coffee was the best-selling coffee maker, and it still is today, because it still makes a delicious cup of coffee. The coffee is still the first choice of coffee lovers. I wanted to live in the Rocky Mountain region. Twelve or thirteen of us have played together now for eight to ten years. We just have a good time. What Tom does is he doesn't care if we make mistakes. He doesn't get down on anybody. A lot of these players depend on Tom Dater for their life insurance. It's all teamwork. It's, you know, no individual players. He's been on their team for 10 years and with New York Life for 18 years. Why would I buy insurance from a stranger when I can buy it from the worst fullback in Boise? New York Life, the company you keep. Some people will go to great lengths to get the benefits of a plain paper fax. Faxes that don't curl and are easy to write on. But what they don't realize is, there's a better way. Hi, I'm Barbara Champney from Minolta, and I'd like to tell you about the new plain paper Minolta Fax 1000. You can use it with your own fax or as a standalone receiver, and it's very affordable. So instead of these, wouldn't you rather get these? Plain paper faxes only from the mind of Minolta. In about 10 minutes, you can either begin making fresh brewed iced tea, or you can begin drinking it. Hmm. The Iced Tea Pot by Mr. Coffee, the modern way to make old-fashioned iced tea. In the season opener against divisional rival Buffalo, Miami came out and played with more enthusiasm than a kid at the circus. Here's the snap to the 10 that are coming after him. Here is the kick. It's blocked. Goal puts recover for a touchdown. The good time soon spread to the offense, where Dan Marino played ringmaster. Snap, Marino looks left, fires for the corner of the end zone, caught for a touchdown! Andre Brown is the man who caught it for the TD. Late in the fourth quarter, the Dolphins seemed all but assured of an opening day win. This is the last play. Dolphins lead 24 to 20. There won't be time for anything else. And here's the snap. He's going to run with the football. He gets in for the score. The Bills win it. Tough loss for Miami. Toughest I've ever seen. Really? It was also the tenth loss in a row against AFC East opponents. But if Miami's maestro on offense seemed to be searching for answers, he found them in short order. Marino's third touchdown pass of the day gave him 200 TDs faster than any quarterback in history as the Dolphins won 24 to 10. But it was the emergence of number 91, Jeff Cross, as a first-class pass rusher, which may have been the day's best news. Cross collected three of the Dolphins' seven sacks against New England, and he didn't stop there. At 6'4", 270 pounds, Cross has the physique to get physical, punishing enemy runners nearly as often as quarterbacks, but not quite. Cross led the team in quarterback sacks with 10, and is the driving beat powering the Miami Pound Machine. The Miami Pound Machine. To NFL quarterbacks, it's an all too vivid description of the Dolphins' young and improving defense. With bright prospects like Cross and T.J. Turner, teamed with old pros like Hugh Green, Barry Krause, and number 70, Brian Soche, Miami rediscovered how to get to the quarterback. Despite missing the first six games of the season, it didn't take linebacker John Offerdahl any time at all to work out the kinks and rediscover the joy of hitting.
Huberdahl finished third on the team in tackles and was named to his fourth consecutive Pro Bowl and third as a starter. And while his ticket to the Pro Bowl was bought at the expense of opponents whom he made pay, he was by no means the Dolphins' only big hitter.